Cool. All right. Thanks, guys, for watching. Uh, I'm going to build a ClickSense extension today. Uh, needed to do this for work. Had this idea for an extension for an application we're building internally. Thought I would do it on camera, give everyone a chance to see uh, how we build things. Maybe kind of do a little series if it's useful enough for uh, people. So I'll show you first the extension we're building and talk about kind of why we're building it. It's a really simple line chart. So I work at Access Group. It's a consulting firm. And we try to monitor, um, you know, our hours that we, you know, build a client's. So I'm building, uh, building a monitor for billability with a simple line chart, but it needs a little extra that goes beyond what ClickSense can do out of the box. So here's an example of what it look, will look like on the left. It's a little line. It'll highlight the min and max values and have a reference line that could be adjustable. Uh, but what I also want is on hover, like on hovering any of these points, I want an additional table to pop up that has information about uh, hours during that week. So the week itself, or the chart itself, is kind of at the weekly level. What's the weekly billability of some person, just a metric. And then when you hover that individual point, drill in further for me and show me in a table that pops up uh, by organization and project, how many hours were, were built by this individual during that specific week. So today I'm gonna attempt to build this. Um, we'll spend an hour on it, so I think we could get the left side in an hour, maybe get to the right side in, 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 within the hour, maybe not, uh, maybe through some shortcuts along the way. I'll show you guys how I'm set up first. So I have a, uh, a VM set up on my computer with ClickSense running. Uh, I've got the management console and ClickSense pulled up. And I have a kind of template here in uh, Visual Studio Code for building extensions. It's kind of a work in progress. Uh, my guy, John Belize at Axis, is working on packaging this up so we can maybe share it with people. Uh, so we'll see if that happens. Uh, right now it's a little bit sloppy still and kind of in progress. But, but I'll walk you through the template so I can kind of define my, um, my extension name up here. And all of these kind of dependencies are for the build process, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, I have a source folder here. So there's an index file, and this index file basically loads different modules from my source folder that's going to control things like the initial properties of my extension, the definition, the controller, paint, etc. We'll get into all this stuff. And then kind of build my extension uh, main file for me. So then in the source folder, I can actually put all these files and work with them from there. So I can host a paint a kind of a modular paint function there, uh, style sheets, etc. What I have with this um, with this uh, extension directory is a script that will bundle it up into an extension for me and actually deploy it to a server. So I have a little configuration here that tells it, you know, where to deploy it on my kind of local virtual machine. And I have a build script here that uses uh, some different libraries, including uh, RxQ, which is a reactive programming interface for the Click APIs that we've been working on at Access Group. And it uses that to basically, uh, uses the script to bundle up uh, our source code into kind of a distribution file. I'll show you what that looks like and then upload it to our server. Uh, so I'll show you real quick on the server right now, if I go to the extensions section, here's my timesheet line and I'm just gonna delete it so we can kind of start from scratch. And what I'm going to do is right now my uh, template's pretty much empty. It's going to have, let's see, it's got pretty much nothing in the paint function. In the template for the extension, I'll put a little like hello world message and save that. And I'm going to go over and kind of run my load script real quick, or my, uh, my bundle script. So uh, write something like script slash build.js, just using node to execute this JavaScript. And that's going to um, create a new bundle for me. So if I go back to my folder here, I now have a distribution folder, or I should have a distribution folder. Let me try one more time. Let me try with all the bells and whistles. See what happens. And it's not working. Oh, there it is, timeline sheet distribution. So in this folder is now my bundled up code, bundled up JavaScript and a QEXT file. And if I go to my server here and refresh this, you'll see that I now have 
my timesheet line is in there and if I kind of pull up a make a kind of a sandbox here and I'll come over to my objects and it's named template right now it needs to change but there it says hello world so we're gonna update the name of it in a in a second but um, you can see kind of the the chart existing there so that's the build process if I change things this will kind of uh, this should update and, and do that kind of stuff so um, let's look at the data real quick uh, I have a data model here it's very simple to support the scramble data just to support building these visualizations it's not really what the real data model looks like in production uh, so I've got two tables, one uh, with client project hours at the person and week starting date level, and then one with billability that's at the person week starting date level. Yes, I'm using a synthetic key. I don't care. It works for me here, so we're going to go with it. Uh, so normally what I like to do when I'm building extensions like this is first build out some sample tables. Uh, and with those sample tables, uh, kind of build a table that represents what the data should look like going into my extension so that I can validate my extension as I'm building it and making sure it matches up. So I, I find that a useful exercise. So I'm just going to create a sheet called data validation and pull up a table. And uh, if I look, look back at the spec, I have kind of week and billability. So I'll put the week starting date as a dimension and I'll do a measure for the billability and I'll just take the average. So this is what the, the data going into the line chart should look like. Let's put it right here. And then I'll copy this, make another table. And for this level of detail, what we really want is the week, not even the week necessarily, we want the uh, organization, which is the kind of the client, the project name, and the number of hours. So I will reset this and we'll add in client project and hours and sum that up and so there's my data there so this is going to help me kind of validate as I go and I can see if I filter this side I get that side so ideally what I want is in my line chart I'm going to create when I hover something like this, uh, I should see this level of detail. Like if I hover March 12th, I should get this detail. Cool, so there's the data. So let's start actually um, creating an extension, the fun part. So what I'm gonna do is pull up this scratch pad. I'm gonna pull up the Chrome Dev Tools, which are gonna help me uh, uh, debug this thing as we go along. I guess I'll dock it to the right. Assuming click will let that work. Let's give it a refresh. So uh, I have my, let's go to my source code here. I don't want to edit the distribution code. Like the source code really is what's going to spit everything out. So I'm going to come in here. I've got the name is timesheet line. I can give it a description. My new extension, whatever. And the template it said, hello world. I'm just going to confirm that this is still working properly. Um, talk about the style in a minute, but just to show that how this is working, I'll talk about what's going on here. I'll make the color maybe red. Now the script is set up that it should automatically bundle this uh, when I update it. So if I like refresh this and put the object on the page, I should get kind of the latest version of it. If I go here, give it a second, to custom objects, I should have an extension called timesheet line. There it is. Drag it to the screen. It's red. It says hello world two, right? So if I go back to my, my build script here, you see that anytime I save any changes to any files, this automatically creates a brand new distribution and puts it up to my server. It happens very quickly. Um, so I find that a really effective way to do kind of local development on an extension but still um, be able to test against a server or against a number of servers. You could kind of expand the script to deploy to multiple places. Uh, and like I said, we'll I think we're going to try to publish this kind of template eventually so that others could take advantage of it. 
Cool. Okay, so I'm going to build a chart. So the first step in building the chart is kind of setting up the area for it. It's going to be an SVG chart. I'm going to use D3. Um, that's another valuable part about this build process is that instead of kind of having to manually pull libraries down and put that together, I'm going to use some of the, uh, I'm going to use kind of Node and, and NPM to uh, more carefully load in my dependencies for my extension. Uh, let's start with the template file here. If you haven't used an extension before, or done an extension this way before, in fact, it might be worth starting at index.js. So I think most people doing extensions are used to defining initial properties, which are uh, define kind of the underlying generic object that feeds your, that uh, is responsible for the data and metadata behind your extension. The definition is what defines the properties panel, so we're going to update that. Uh, you're probably familiar with the paint function, which is for rendering, and maybe even the resize function. I'm going to comment out the resize function today because I don't have time to build a separate paint and resize function. That maybe I'll do that in a future stream on like refactoring. So for now, I'm going to do what I consider kind of the brute force method of repainting, which I'll show. And then support, which is data around like should it support exporting, printing, and things like that. The two you may not be familiar with because they're not well documented are uh, templates and controllers. This is kind of just part of uh, the Angular 1 structure, which is what ClickSense uses. So a controller contains kind of uh, uh, logic for the component. It runs once when the component initializes. So we can use that to kind of set our canvas and then rely on paint to update things. Uh, that becomes pretty important when you start to use like update patterns with resize, which we might show in a refactor one day. The template, uh, you can actually populate HTML into your extension with, before you even go into a paint function. So you don't have to use JavaScript, your own JavaScript, to inject uh, HTML into your extension. You can define your own template and feed it in. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. I have this chart container. I want to put an SVG in there. I just want the SVG to kind of fill the whole thing. So I'm going to create an SVG element like this. I also want a tooltip. Eventually, I'm going to have a tooltip that hovers, you know, or that kind of overlays the image on hover. So let me create this div. Uh, I'm actually going to put it outside the chart container for now. Maybe it's going to go back there. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I'm going to give it a class of tooltip. And the reason I'm going to give it this class is that I'm going to go to my style sheet here, and I don't want this tooltip to be visible. So I'm going to add a display to none, right? I only want the tooltip visible when it's being hovered. So later on, we'll, may, we may today, if we get to it, add code to show that. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hide the whole thing. I'm also going to adjust my SVG here and um, give it a... Um, width of 100% and a height of 100%. So I want it to match the external container. So my container right now is kind of on the outside and that's going to fill the window because it has a or fill the available space for the extension because it has a width and height of 100%. And then the SVG is going to fill that because it's the child of that. So that's going to also fill kind of the entire container. Um, one thing you may notice in my CSS is that I'm not writing like .qb object dash blah 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 which you know normally when you write uh, extension uh, CSS, you want to namespace it to your extension so that your uh, CSS only affects your extension and not other parts of the ClickSense client. So you could do something like uh, qb-object-timeline-sheet or something like that. Um, however, uh, this kind of template I'm using does that for you. So it looks at whatever name you define for the extension and during the build process it injects that for you. So if I actually go and look, so I write the CSS this way and don't have to worry about writing all these kind of annoying, uh, uh, I forget what you call them in CSS, but uh, the, uh, the namespaces or whatever. If I actually look at the CSS on the page here, it's going to just like append that for me. Let me find it. That's not it. Right, so you see here it's, it's kind of, uglified here, but .qb dash object just timesheet dash line dot chart container, right? It automatically put that in front of it for me, so I don't have to worry about writing that in my CSS. So there's some nice things as part of that build process. Um, so let's put this SVG in here. Let's just make sure it's working. We'll put a border around it and see what's going on. Um, so you see there's a border here now around this object. 
that border is being drawn because I have um, you know applied that style for the the black line around the SVG. Let's make sure you guys can see it. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is um, I need to get D3 in here because I'm going to end up using it, so I'm going to load it in. And the way I'm going to add it is first I need to make it part of kind of my package for my extension. So I'm going to run into this terminal and do an npm install D3 and save it as a dependency. Um, so that's going to like load the whole D3 package and save it as a dependency for me in uh, my code in kind of this node modules folder. So now I can import it and reference that. So in my paint function, uh, or in my control, I'm going to be able to reference it. So the first thing I'm going to do in paint, actually, is I'm going to um, get the element. And when you use paint, what it's kind of coming back with is this dollar element, which is using Angular's jQuery Lite, which is fine, but I usually try to avoid using it because I'm doing other DOM manipulation other places. I'm not using jQuery Lite, so it's kind of confusing to like use it for this one element but not use it for others. So I'm going to go ahead and make this element, um, get the underlying element for that, uh, which you can just kind of access that that entity. And so if I kind of console that out and save it, we will see here's the element. And so it's got um, the kind of extension objects element that contains my, within it, you know, children like my chart container and my tooltip and things like that. And my chart container has my SVG. So to, I do want to do a couple things. I want to get the width and height of my extension, and I want to get my SVG and probably reset it. As I mentioned before, I'm going to use the brute kind of force method of just like every paint, clearing out the canvas and redrawing the whole thing. It's not the best way to do things, uh, but it's the quickest for kind of an hour-long uh, demo like this. So what I'll do is we'll say the container is... We'll get the container, we'll get the SVG, and I'm actually going to wrap the SVG in a D3 selection to use uh, D3, and I'll talk about how we do that in a second. Okay, so I haven't really, I'm using D3 here, but I haven't really loaded in anywhere. I mean, I, I import it into my node modules, but I haven't told my code to actually use this anywhere. Um, so this is kind of the nice part of using a build system like this. I can import whatever I need where I need it. So I'll import everything um, as D3 from the D3 package. What's also nice about this is that I can actually select, you see I'm doing import star, which loads every single piece of D3. But D3 is very modular and organized into uh, different uh, classes or groups of, of functions, really modules. I could load in just the pieces I wanted. So if I wanted just like the kind of select functionality, I could import select from D3. And the nice thing about that is that I'm going to end up getting smaller bundles out of the whole thing. But for now, I'm just going to import stars D3. And I have that. And we'll just confirm that this is working. Let's move this desktop around. There's my chart and there's my selection. If I kind of store this as a global variable real quick and look at the underlying node, there's my SVG, right? So I've got all that. Is it possible to move the camera to the right? The video with me. Let me see. Hold on. Ah, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yes, it is possible. Hold on. Uh, where's OBS? Uh, 
Uh, it should be possible, but I can't find the uh, OBS. What the heck? Let me try one more thing here. I don't know. I lost it. I don't know where the OBS went, so I'm not going to be able to move the image. So I'll try to keep the dev tools. Out. I'll move the dev tools back to the right. Oh, there it is. Now it just randomly appeared. Okay. But I can't move it while I'm streaming, so I guess not. So I'll have to just use the dev tools as is here. I'll move it to the right. How about that? That should be better. Okay, so here's that Node SVG. I'm going to move a little bit faster here. So I apologize. Uh, now what I want to do is get the dimensions of this thing. So I know what kind of dimensions to set. We'll say, get them right here. I'm just getting the width and height of the container object. And on my SVG element here, I'm going to clear out the contents to kind of reset it. And then I'm going to update the size if needed. So I'm going to say the width of it is the width and the height of it is the height. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and remove the CSS to do the percentages because I don't need that now. I'm going to kind of do it with JavaScript. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm going to do some margin stuff later. So in my SVG, I want to set up kind of a plot area. Um, I want the chart to be in there, but I need room for like axes and things like that. So it's common in D3 to do this pattern where you set up a margin array or object rather. And that object would have the, dimen the dimensions of kind of the margins. So maybe we'll put 10 pixels on top. Uh, 10 pixels to the left. We want a bigger margin for the right axis, so maybe we'll start with 50 pixels and we can adjust based on what we see. Another 10 pixels on the bottom. And what I'm going to do next is create a plot. So my plot is going to be just a group of SVG elements that are going to be moved based on the margin. Like I want them to be moved over 10 pixels from the top, 10 pixels from the left. You know, since it's ba the coordinates are based on the top left corner. So I'll say svg dot append ag. We can just class it as plot so we have it that for reference. And I'm going to create a transform here. I'm using ES6 with part of the build system, which is nice because then I can do some stuff you can't necessarily do in ES5, such as translate, and we'll do margin.left, margin.top. So now anything I put in the plot is going to be moved over 10 pixels from the top, 10 pixels for the left. So that's the value of the plot. Um, and it will allow me to place the axes appropriately. OK, so I need to get some data into this thing. So I need to update the definitions for it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to do, thanks to some of the click uh, default settings uh, that you can uh, reference. So for example, um, I have this definition file which uh, uses the properties panel. Uh, maybe I want to add data to this like dimensions and measures. Probably going to get this wrong the first try. This is why I'm doing it. Let's see. I think you put uses dimensions. That'll give me a dimensions panel. I think if I put uses measures, that'll give me a measures panel. See if that works. Yep, there's a dimensions met panel, there's a measures panel. Uh, for this, I want to limit it to one dimension and one measure. Um, so if someone like adds a dimension, I don't want them to keep adding dimensions. Like if they add, that oh, didn't even work, so that's not good. Um, try something here. Hold on. 
Ah, I know what it is. Um, in my initial properties, I need to create a hypercube here, some information. So I will make an initialized hypercube definition. And I'm going to use uh, something we created at Axis Group called the kick structure generator to get this template in place. Um, so this is a nice little resource that allows you to kind of build a hypercube on the fly. So I'm going to have some dimensions. We'll start empty. I'm going to have some measures that'll be empty. And I'm going to have an initial data fetch. I'm going to have a single page for that. That page is going to be, I can update it from here. I believe that's all I need to get this thing working properly. The initial data fetch will start at zero, which is the first column. Start at the first row, which is also zero. It's going to be one dimension, one measure, so that's two columns. And we'll just put um, 5,000 rows. I'm putting 5,000 rows because in click, the max page size you can have is 10,000 cells, which is you know rows times columns. So 2 times 5,000 is 10,000. I don't anticipate that we're actually going to get that much data for this chart, uh, but that should cover us there. So let me go back here and let's delete this bad boy and uh, give it a refresh and try building it again. Here's the timesheet line. Let's see if I add a dimension this time, I'll add week starting date. There's week starting date. What you see is I can keep adding dimensions, which I don't want people to do. So I will, uh, as part of this definition, you can add some additional properties like min and max, which is the min and max number of dimensions. So I want one dimension, min and max, if that's all I want to put in there. Same on this side. So I put one on both sides. Now it's not gonna, it's only gonna work if one dimension and one measure are defined at all times. So I'll add a measure, we'll just show you real quick. See now I can't add a second dimension, so it's not gonna let me. So I'll add my measure from before, which is the average billability percentage. And now I have my blank canvas. Um, I'm going to use my layout, so I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, the layout, when you, know, you can use the paint function, has the actual data on it. Um, in fact, it, the data exists under a property called something, the Q matrix, which is in something like layout.qhypercube.q data pages of 0.q matrix. I think that's right. Let's just console it out and see if we got that right. Yep, so there's my data coming in. Uh, there's a day. Um, there is a um, value. It's not sorted properly. In the interest of time, I'm just going to sort it in D3. Uh, really, you should use click, uh, Click's properties to sort it. Um, but I'm going to do it the sloppy way for now because I know how to sort these things faster. I just know off the top of my head how to do it in D3. So let me, or really in JavaScript, let's move this data logic up here. And we'll do Q matrix dot sort. Sort function takes two elements to compare. It's going to compare two at a time, kind of pairwise across an array. And it needs to return an indicator of whether something should be greater or smaller than that. I want to return, you know, I want to sort it by this QNUM in the first entity. So I'll say, uh, return a of 0.qnum greater than b of 0.qnum, maybe. I might have that backwards, let's see. I did get that backwards because this looks like it's sorting. No, it's not sorting at all. This is why we have Stack Overflow. Yep, 
They fade out. Right. Do else return one. Let's try that. Cool. Now it's sorted properly, so you can see the dates are kind of incrementing that way. All right, have a sorted array. So now I want to you know, draw this line. I want you know, each point to draw out. I need to make a scale for that. I'm going to need to make an X scale for all the uh, week starting dates. And then I'm going to need to make a Y scale for like where does the point in the line go. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to do. Uh, I'll set it up. I'll tell you what, let's set it up uh, above all of the DOM manipulation stuff just to keep that separate. So my margin, I'm going to make an X scale, which is going to be... Um, a you can do it a point scale, I guess. Uh, I'm gonna feed it all of the Q matrix values. Uh, let's do text is fine. The range of that scale is gonna be from zero to the width of the. Ooh, actually, I want to calculate plot width and height, so I do need to move this stuff up a little bit. Um, I'm going to create a separate uh, value for plot widths because I want to know like kind of what's the width minus the space for axes, minus the space for the margins, essentially. So plot plot width is width minus margin dot left minus margin dot right. Plot height is height minus margin dot top minus margin dot bottom. Cool. Now I can use plot width here. My y scale is going to be a linear scale. So I'm going to make the domain. Um, it, let's hard code it for now. We can come back if we have time and, and adjust it later. Well, we can do it the right way. All right, so the um, click hypercube layout will have the min and max values on it. In my case, I want to always at least go to 100% because I'm using like a out of 100% metric, although you could exceed 100%. So I'm always going to start at zero for my chart, and then I want to say, okay, like the data max, I'll just separate it out to make this clean, um, equals uh, layout.q hypercube, q measure, look at the measures, look at the first measure, and get the q max value. And I can say take the math.max of data max or one. So essentially, um, I want, you know, if it's less than one, then just go ahead and make this thing one. And the range is going to be uh, zero to, it's actually backwards. If it's zero, I want it at the bottom. So it's going to be plot height to zero. Um, we can test if these scales are working pretty easily if we just like kind of console them out and this is my sloppy way of debugging this stuff so I'm gonna um, spit these scales out and just like do some quick sanity checks in the console with them. I'm gonna start with the Y scale because I have better faith in myself that I got that one right. I'm not so sure about the X scale. Oh nice, can't read Property query selector of undefined. Probably move some stuff around improperly. Yeah, this goes up here. Let's try this again. All right, so there's the Y scale. Um, here's my Y scale if I do dot domain. 0 to 130 percent, so whoever's anonymized data this is is working a lot, good for them. Um, and the range is from 575 to 0, so if I do something like temp1 of let's say 50 percent, gets me like kind of somewhere in the middle. 
Let's look at the other one, just confirm that one's working. So temp2 will be my dimension scale. If I do temp2.domain, I should get back all the possible dates. It's working. Look at the range. If I say something like temp1 of the second date, yeah, temp2 rather, excuse me. Right, about 25 pixels over. Cool, so we have our scales working. Now we need to make a line function. So we'll make this line function here uh, using D3 line. And that takes in an X function, an accessor. So we'll say take the data and from it return X scale of the date value and take the, for the Y value, take the data and get the uh, numeric value of the second one. Yeah, something like that. Why do I feel like I have too many? Oh yeah, Y scale. Something like this. So that's kind of a generator that'll generate a, a path for us. All right, so now we can do our, our nice dumb manipulation down here. We will take our plot and add a line to it. So we'll just call it... Uh, uh, we'll just call it path. I'm going to say take the plot and append a path element to it, which is a, a line with multiple vertices in it. And we will say that the um, data attribute is equal to line of our Q matrix data, which we sorted. Um, the last thing I want to do is style this thing. So let's go to the CSS. Uh, we don't have any styles for the SVG anymore, but for the path, let's do this a little bit smarter. Let's go ahead and give this a class as well. Let's just call it. We'll say the stroke is black, stroke width one pix, let's make it two pixels just so we can see it. We don't want any fill on this path. The moment of truth, will this work? Let's see. Nice, so there's a line. Um, one nice thing about this self-service model, right, is that I can just like test this pretty quickly to make sure my the shape of my data is accurate. So I copy and paste this extension below and just like take the ClickSense line chart and over kind of lay it like this and convert it. There's the line chart and look at that, it looks the same. So uh, progress so far, we have a line. Next we need to add axes uh, or maybe even the accents for the, the, the min and max. Start with the axes, I forgot that we needed space on the bottom of the axis for a, uh, is there an x-axis on this chart? Maybe there isn't. Let me look at the spec. I guess there's no x-axis. All right, we don't need the x-axis then because the hover, I guess, covers you for that. So we'll just do the, the y-axis. The D3 has some functions for that, uh, specifically D3 axis. Very intuitive. So we'll say y-axis function, and this is really like a generator is d3.axis right, because it's going on the right side, and we're going to say the x scale is the x scale, and the y scale, of course, but, or actually maybe there's no, don't need a x scale for this. The y scale is the, I think it's that scale, y scale. Let's, let's go to the tape, let's check the d3.docs. Wrong place. Axis right, and you give axis, axes, is it a scale property? Let's see. Yeah, dot scale. All right, I got it right. So uh, d3 dot axis right dot scale is equal to this. I need to put it over onto that right side so that it shows up. 
where it needs to show up. So I'm going to make a, another G group kind of element for the axis itself. I'm going to call this um, the, the group for the axis, the G axis. I'll append that um, to the actual plot, I think. to play with this a little bit. I'm going to class it so I can add some my own CSS later. Call it axis. Uh, call it x dot axis. So it gets a couple classes there. And um, we're going to move it to the right side of the page. So I'm going to take this transform. Do another transform here. And do a translate. And we're going to move it over. We're not going to move it anywhere in the oh, wrong way. We're not going to move it up or down at all, so we'll just leave zero here. We are going to move it the kind of width of the plot, so it's on the, the end of the plot. So we'll put plot width here. And then uh, inside this axis, I can say call my y axis that I defined above. And the nice thing about D3, if I did this properly, is that um, out of the box, it does like most really what you kind of want with just that, those few lines of code. Right, so there's an axis. It's a good starting point. Um, not super happy with it for a couple reasons. Like the formatting's off, right? Like I don't want, I don't think of percentages in dot, you know, dot eight. I want to see like 80%, something like that. Also, it's too many ticks for me. I just want like a few ticks, ticks being each one of these points. So D3 axis, really easy to update that piece of it as well. Um, I can just come up here and say, let's do, um, let's put in like five. This is like a suggestion. It doesn't necessarily always do exactly five, but you, it tries to get close to five based on whatever algorithms it uses to figure out how to uh, spread the, uh, the uh, tick marks out. And I can also do tick format, I think, uh, and I can feed it kind of D3 has its own number format um, kind of input. I think percentage will do the percentages, but I'm not sure we can experiment until we get that right. No, nope, that definitely wasn't it. Let me uh, let's look at the tick format. Ah, uh, right. I think you need to. Def I need to find this as D three dot format. Cool. Almost there. It just added a bunch of zeros at the end, which I didn't really want. Um, so I think if I do something like. Well, one easy way to test this out is there's like a D3 number format little uh, tool online that is pretty great because you can like enter an example number like I have 0.8 here and uh, this is actually the exact format I want. You can kind of try your own formats out and it will show you what the result would be. So it's very quick and easy to test. But it looks like they already have my example here, which is that I just want per comma percent to get that formatted properly. No, and this is using D3 version 3, unfortunately. In D3 version 4, they changed the um, setup a little bit. Let's see. I wonder if uh, maybe comma 0.0%. Let's try that. It should be y dot axis. Someone mentioned in the chat. Uh, that's right. So let me change that. Y dot axis. Um, okay, so there's the axis, right? Less points than before. Um, it's drawn uh, pretty nicely there, um, and it's formatted. Uh, we've got about 12 minutes left for what I said I was going to do. Um, so maybe what I'll show you next is uh, adding. Uh, let's add the reference line. I could add hovers and stuff like that, but the reference lines 
fun and difficult because it's going to involve the properties panel, which is always a thing. I'm going to preemptively get this click uh, API documentation handy. Um, so what I want to do is I want to add an input, a numeric input somewhere where someone can say, like, in here I want to define a a uh, a reference line value. So I'm going to do a quick and dirty one. It's not going to look great. I can do styling stuff later. Um, the best way to work with the properties panel is just to go to the help and go down to widgets and extensions, visualization extensions, and then down to the uh, properties panel basics. Defining custom properties, and I want a custom uh, number property. And it'll give you a nice little example here. Like within settings, I can add my own item, which is going to look something like this. So I can copy and paste. So this is easier than I thought it was going to be. So I add my own uh, property. I'm going to call it uh, reference line. Type's going to be a number. Label is going to be reference line. I'm going to place it on my generic object just under the, the, the property name reference line. And the default value is going to be 0 0.8. Let's see if that works. One thing about kind of, and I want to initialize this too. So if I go to my uh, initial properties, I'll go ahead and add that to the generic object definition. Oops, this is JSON, so it should be like this. Cool. So one thing to note here is that um, I changed some structure, some of the structure of the generic object, but it's like already been created here. So it's not going to have all that metadata that I really want it to have. I mean, there's the reference line property, and I can kind of update it from here. Um, and let me show you how you access that. It's actually pretty easy. It's going to come right out of the layout. So if I just put the layout out of here. On the layout, you'll see besides the hypercube and a bunch of metadata that Click provides, uh, there's the reference line value. And if I like change this back to 0 0.8, it's going to update, a, like run my paint again with my new reference line value. So I can use that now to draw a reference line. Very easy. I'll just call this. Let's put it behind the path. I want the path to overlay it. So we'll say var ref line equals plot dot append. I'll use the line element this time. It's a little bit easier than defining a path because the line element lines can just have two vertices, like a start and an end point. It's very easy to, to think about. Uh, so the line is going to have an attribute of, uh, oh crap, what is it? It's like x1, y1, or something like that. SVG line. Let's see. x1 and x2. Okay, so x1 is going to be 0. x2 is going to be the plot width. So we just want it to span the entire plot. Uh, y1 is going to be um, y scale of my reference line value. And Y2 is going to be the same thing because I just want it to be a, a straight line or a kind of flat line. Okay, Y scale of that. And then let's give it a class so we can style it. So we'll class it as reference line true. Let's go to the CSS and we'll make the stroke... Uh, Gray. How about that? Stroke dash width. We'll just make it a little bit smaller. In fact, we'll give it a, a make it a dash look. So we have a kind of dash line in the background. Let's see. Cool. So there's the eighty percent reference line, and as I like change this, you know. Uh, that line's going to move up to 90% or down to 20% or wherever I kind of want it to live. So there's my reference line. We have seven minutes left. Maybe we can add the min and max circles. Maybe we go a little bit longer and add the hover. Um, let's see if we can do it. Uh, okay. Uh, one thing that's driving me crazy is this axis is too close to the thing. So I'm going to move the axis too. I'm going to transform the axis maybe plus five pixels and let that Give us some breathing room.
Cool. Okay. So I want to draw a min and max circle. So I need to know where the kind of like min and max circles are in the data set. So I need to kind of go through the Q matrix here and uh, here I'll store it as a variable. So if I have Q matrix dot, uh, well, let me pull it up. I need to figure out where the, the objects for those min and max points are. Um, there's a function we can use for in D3 that'll help us get that index. I'm trying to remember what it's called. Um, let's look at in the D3 array library, there's something called uh, it's not min, but hold on. Here we go. Scan. This is what I want. Um, scan will turn the index of an element that meets some kind of criteria. In this case, I want to get like where the smallest and biggest elements are. So let's just test it out and say, I want to take the Q matrix. I'll say var min index equals D three dot scan Q matrix. A comma B. Um, we're going to say back. Let's do this the shorthand way. A of zero dot no A of one dot Q num. I want to take the measure. Minus a of b of one dot q num, and then we'll say more min value or min object. How about min cell? Make it nice. Is q matrix of min index, and let's console that out. Let's see if that looks right. I don't know. Says the first point was the lowest one. It looks like the smallest one, so that looks about right. And now to do the max one, we can just kind of flip this thing around. Uh, so we'll call this max. We'll get the max index, um, and we'll say instead of a minus b, we'll do b minus a, so that it it flips them. Let's make sure that worked. Says the max point was 312. If I look on here, 312, that looks like the max point. The value was 132%. Uh, percent. Perfect. That's definitely the, the biggest one. Okay, so we have min and max now. So let's just add those as circles at the end here. Uh, we'll call this uh, bar min circle equals plot.append circle. Ah. Put the center of the circle. At x scale of our min cell of zero dot q text, put our the center of the circle at the y scale position of min cell of one dot q num. We'll give it a radius of start with three, and we'll, let's class it. Let's repeat that for the max circle. Just change this to max valks. I'm going to color them differently. Max cell, max cell. Let's adjust the CSS here. Wait, what was it called? Min dash val, max dash val. Let's say fill is red. We want it red for the smallest one. This is going to be ugly for now. Um, just to get this thing working, we can style it later. We'll do steel blue for the max value. Let's see if that works. Oh no. Didn't write the class function right. Uh, if you just Call dot class with only one parameter, it returns true or false, like letting you know does it have the class. But I wanted to give it the class, not check for the class, so I need the second parameter in that function. Let's 
see. Well, the minimum one showed up. Oh, they both showed up. They're just really small and hard to see. Okay, so yeah, there's the red one. There's the blue one. Probably want to make those bigger. Uh, it's just about 11.30, but I'm curious to see if like, I go an extra five minutes, could I get at least hovering going? And I kind of want to show how you do that with D3. Um, so I'm going to maybe go a little, maybe like five to ten minutes over and get the hovering mechanism in place in terms of like showing how you hover against the point um, and uh, triggering some sort of event. But then the whole implementation of the drill in to additional data is a much more complicated topic that I'll have to wait for maybe another stream. So I have all these, uh, these data points here. And uh, what I want to do, wow, that's like too big now. That's okay. Uh, what I want to be able to do is kind of like hover near the point and then um, and have the, uh, the point be highlighted. You know, so there's a couple different options. To me, the best option is typically to draw kind of like bars, invisible bars overlaid across the screen so that like if I just hover in, in the vertical area of this thing, I'll, I'll get it right. Um, that can be tricky when using a, a point scale like this. Um, so for today, since we're kind of short on time, what I'm going to do is just put overlay circles, and then next time I can kind of show how you would do bars instead, which require a little bit better setup with the scales and the math to get the, the, the uh, rectangles kind of like properly aligned around them. So I'll make overlay circles at least in this case. So what we'll do is we'll take our Q matrix data from before, uh, let's create a whole plot for this. We'll call this overlay G. We'll say plot.append G. And I'm going to add overlay circles to that, that G. So I'll say overlay G. Dot. This is going to use D3's kind of data entry mechanism. So I'm going to say select all circles that exist in this thing. Uh, and then I want you to add kind of bind data to it. I'm going to bind the Q matrix data to it. And I want you to enter those elements. And when you enter them, I want you to draw them. Uh, let's draw them not invisible first. We can just see that it's working. Um, it's actually going to be the similar code what we did up here in our line function, except different uh, parameters. So we're going to say for the CX parameter, do this. For the CY parameter, do that. Let's class them. And let's give them let's give them a big kind of hit radius. I'm gonna bring this thing down to like four for these these values and then give a a much bigger hit radius. Maybe we'll start with ten pixels just to exaggerate this thing a bit. Let's give it a style. Let's see, circle dot overlay. We'll say the fill is gray, and let's give it opacity. So we can see the line behind it. Let's see if I got that right. Oh no, no dot get attribute is not a function. Let's see. Oh, I never appended a circle to it. Well, that was dumb. When the data comes in, I want to append an actual circle element to it. Let's try that again. Okay, so now I have all these kind of overlaid circles. Um, of course, I don't want it to look like this in real life. I just want those to be like when I hover in that area, I want it to trigger the event to show the, the pop-up, for example. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them invisible eventually. But for now, just to keep them visible, I'll show you adding events to these is pretty easy. Um, I could have, could have added it right there, but I'm just going to make it separate for now and say, okay, overlay circles dot uh, on mouse enter. And now I have this callback I can execute. So I can do something like, uh, probably the most annoying thing I could do is alert, send an alert like uh, d of zero dot q text, which would be the week starting date, I think. So if I do this now,
So when I hovered that, it said that's the week you're looking at right now. In real life, what I'm going to do is end up, um, we're going to put code in place to um, trigger a pop-up instead of this kind of like annoying alert. So I'm going to console that out for now. So it's been about an hour. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Obviously need to work on figuring out the streaming thing. Um, if people are interested, I could potentially post snippets from this code in different places. So you could go check it out and review it in more depth. But uh, yeah, thanks for uh, joining the stream. I appreciate it. I gotta figure out how to stop it.